how a conscious penta might be realized. And again, because all of this, a lot of this is speculation, when we actually come to the experience of encountering these pentas, we shall see how it really works. And also um, in dealing with conscious penta, should you be so fortunate to come across one in future? We'll see. I'm really looking forward. Please, everybody, do remember to keep me abreast of any encounters that you have, hey, because I'm very excited to hear. So let's begin with, again, reminding ourselves of how we identify the rave. The dilemma begins, according to Ra, is the impact of understanding the full potential of what it is to be quad right. So if you know any quad rights, or if you are yourself a quad right, even then, you don't have a way of operating fully, cognitively, right, in the way that a rave would. Because we as human beings are inherently strategic and rave quad rights will be incredibly receptive beyond the nature of what we can comprehend at this moment in time or as humans ourselves. They will still be people, but they're not human. So raves... Quad rights are going to be fundamentally receptive. And according to Ra, even for a quad right human, homo sapien intransitus at this moment, even for them, it would be hard for them to grasp. So he's giving us an image as far as the coming of the rave child. So let's imagine our client is asking us for some assistance with their rave baby because they find an article or a video that we post or a podcast or something. And we describe the rave baby, one that seems to be incapacitated to have completely abnormal functions and does not demonstrate in any way the general physical reactions of what we would consider to be our baby, our strategic human baby. So the receptivity of this child is not something that would be understood by especially people who are not studying human design. You know, they are seeing the lack of what we would consider to be or the homogenized world would consider to be viable human attributes. So what's wrong with my baby? Probably being something that this woman is screaming or man or whoever the case may be however they identify. So we have on our hands then the first Uranian creature. An individual rave will be really handicapped from our perception of being human. And not so much that it will stay that way in sense of its motor processes, muscular development. Those maturing processes will be very, very slow in a rave because of its ability to express its unusualness. We think about Uranus and how wacky, strange, eccentric, weird, all the keynotes we know to attribute, oh, sudden, shocking, evolutionary. You know, this is a creature that has never been seen before. And we are not Uranian creatures. We have a nine-centered Homo sapien and transitus form, but we are an interregnum, as we have discussed previously in this course. Ra's suspicion is, quote, it's not so much that raves will not have reasonable physical attributes at some level. It's just going to take them a long time to develop. They're going to mature physically much slower. And that's actually in keeping, oh, unquote, that's actually in keeping with what I notice about our current um, children. You know, the children that are currently about to reach, let's say, their 20s, you know, our teenagers. Have you noticed that they seem a whole heck of a lot younger than we were at that age? Or maybe it's just me. I don't know. But to my um, seeing and witnessing, it seems that this younger generation right now, where we still have children at home, well, they might still feel, seem like children all the way up until 30. Yeah, that slowing, slowing down of the maturing process because, you know, we are nine centered and a nine centered homo sapien in transitus, the maturing of our form, full 
fulfillment of our life's work, 50 and beyond, which, you know, in the homogenized day and age, people think, oh, retirement age, (laughs) I'm done. Time to sail off into the sunset. No, that's just when your work is starting. Your life's work is able to be planted. So we identify a rave. Um, Some people will think the terms, what is this aberration? What is this mutation? You know, what's wrong with this child? It's also interesting, besides the slowing of the maturity, that they Ra imagines that they're going to have a very different metabolism. So the physicality of them living out their Iranian cycle first being slow and also that they won't need as much sustenance. So they're going to metabolize is what he thinks in a very different way. Not having to eat maybe the kinds of mass that we eat, even a quad right. If you know anything about the people who have a brain body system, so sun earth on the unconscious side, that is right. You know that we eat less. We just do. We don't tend to um, eat as often or as much unless we are deliberately dumbing ourselves down. I say that R because I am one of those. It's my only right facing variable arrow. So constantly being accused of eating like a little bird, sit down and eat with the family. Why aren't you hungry? You're too skinny. Like I grew up with that. Yeah, not not eating enough. And what's wrong with you? (laughs) You're not eating with the family. Why aren't you eating with us? You know, bonding over food and such, especially if you have a parent like that 40, 37. Hey, so you're going to notice then that with this very different metabolism, just trying to link it to what you already know, thinking about this being a rave being quad right anyway, not needing as much sustenance makes logical sense. Absolutely logical sense. Okay, difficult, difficult, different metabolism, I should say. Now, when it comes to a rave, another point, key point of interest is that physical strength is no longer the point for them. And as Ross says, quote, it's interesting to note that we move in this, as we move in this evolutionary pattern, if you go from the power, the heavy boneness of Neanderthal to Cro-Magnon, and then you get to rave, you're going to see that the physical strength of the body is no longer the point. So in other words, the evolutionary direction is moving towards different ways of being able to communicate to receive data, to exchange data, to move, to evolve. We're looking at evolution, yeah? But to our human eyes, it will seem as though the form itself is devolving in terms of how we had to evolve. We were survival of the fittest back in the day. Yeah, strong, fast, all of these strategic things, logical And yet the rave is evolving an evolution out of us. And so it's going in a different direction. So if we were to imagine, you know, the human tree where, okay, here's us as humans, nine centered homo sapien and transitus. And then we have a branching off that looks like a physical devolving, but to a receptive being, they're actually an evolution out of us. Yeah, and then we, a dead end, but rave intending to continue to evolve. And as Ross said, we'll never get to that point of um, really seeing what they're going to become in full, the totality of an 11-centered human, or rave, I should say, (laughs) rave creature because they're only going to have 1300 years to evolve approximately. So we'll never see the fullest experience of them on this planet. So this transformation, we're going to get what appears to be from our human perspective, a rave body is not well adapted to living on this physical plane. So the body seeming to be handicaps, okay, handicaps. And that is because they're actually not going to be living on our plane, not fully. Our plane is dense, as in 
our perception of the physical physicality is limited to a certain density. And the rave has this capacity to live on a plane or a dimension that we cannot access. Okay, so we have another piece here that Katja gave to me to um, give to you as an element. Let's see, page 145 of this manual. So skipping ahead a bit, he says, quote, if we go back to the evolutionary track, I've been giving you this story, we accept for a moment my theorizing that Neanderthal okay, was right-oriented. So the thing to recognize about the right is that was a preparation for what would be our strategic transformation or the mutation that follows. So everything that has been learned through this strategic process and what's been happening to our bodies as we entered into the nine-centered interregnum in 1781. All of that is leading us to pay less attention to the physical functions of the body. Have you noticed that people tend to get, are being more frail and weak overall? Because this mutation is about shutting down certain physical areas of the body and we transform that energy resource, the saving, he says, if you will, transform that into a capacity to be able to handle the environment without having to do so on the physical plane. So to reiterate, this rave is about handling the environment through different dimensional fields. And that is why we won't have uh, access, we don't have access to what it really means for them to be quad right wave compared to our Homo sapiens and transitus quad right currently. I hope I've been clear there. So, to make it very clear, rave is not human. The tendency to think about them as a human, um, you know, they're probably going to get a lot of enemies first. The people who think that they're the demon spawn or aberrations or, you know, um, should be exposed to the elements in certain countries without the capacity to care for a being their entire lives. What else are they going to do? You know, it depends on where you live in the world. So there's this story that Ra gives us about the elephant the blind men and the elephant, where one holds the elephant's nose and says that it's a snake. Is it a snake or is it a tree? Because another person touches its leg and says, well, no, this is the tree. Raves are not the trunk and not the leg, not the story here. Raves are a piece of the elephant. Okay, so they're a piece of the elephant. When they come together, there will be something more than that elephant. The penta is the elephant. So watching out for an elephant is very important. You just come across a leg or a trunk laying on the ground, not so scary, not so dangerous. But the elephant is really something, a force to be reckoned with. So when these babies come together in their full penta, then humanity will have to deal with them. And we will see what kind of level of interaction we will have. We have tons of speculation within this um, presentation. So let's see as far as how this might show up. Exploring the design of a rave means that we're going to have to look at penta. So we can only explore the conscious penta by understanding how deep the themes of the rave are adapted to the strategic resources of penta. Meaning the penta itself is going to, it is going to become conscious, not the individual leg or trunk or what have you. If you understand penta mechanics through family practice or through BG5 or any studies in OC16, then you know that a penta is not functional, it's actually called dysfunctional. If there's ever a gap within that group of three to five people where one of the activations is not present within the component part, 
And that's one of the things that we have to address. Okay, not functional. It's a dysfunctional penta. So we have to get you up to speed on how that works in order to understand how a conscious penta may work. So each of these individual raves, they do participate in the process of pentaness they will all watch their mind. So kind of like, you know, uh, we who have processes that can see our minds fold, unfolding out in, in front of us or looking at our mind and its operation, it's kind of like that as far as what it might be to be in a penta. However, if you look at this body graph, there is no mind represented there. There's no mind in a penta. I remember head and ashna, mind, right? So no mind in a penta. What a penta is good for, remember this is a trans-auric entity, a controlling mechanism, what, that, what happens between three to five people. For us who are human, we move in and out. For those who are rave, they will be locked in. So pentas are designed to be good at engaging in the material world and controlling or homogenizing things in order to be competitive, to demonstrate the model of what it is that they represent as a group. So if we look at the tonal ar architecture first of rave, you know, we are rave body graph people, even though we are still in transitus, we can see the one smell, two is taste, Three is outer vision, four is inner vision, five is feeling, and six is touch, as a reminder. We know that the rave will only be right. Okay, The architecture of the rave will be right, right-facing variable arrow. That means they will have one of these three, either tone four, inner vision, tone five, feeling, and tone six, touch. So their co cognitive architecture tonal architecture is going to be right. For these raves to bond together in Penta, they have to be first rave. And then in order for them to bond between each other, to have that bond to the totality, the Penta, what is it truly to be right? All of these three aspects of what we call right for which is inner vision, five, which is feeling, six, which is touch. They are all simply about frequency. The core of frequency is sound. We can think about five and link it to frequency, feeling, cognition, actually encapsulates all of frequency. So here we're talking about the reception of frequencies inward, the inner vision, the inner realms. Feeling is cognitively attuned to all frequencies, touch, even moving beyond. So how can it touch you deeply to be able to feel what the inner vision is telling you? To us who are strategic, I'm just saying words. To them, it shall be experiential as part of the process. So first, let's look at four, the inner vision of rave. We're dealing with a visual frequency that isn't outside. So rather than a strategic person that focuses on a single point, okay, a, sing a strategic per person pointing left, it would be outer vision. Okay, and when you're looking at the outer vision of world, you shall see something specific that catches your eye, you know, focused if you were left. Now, the advantage of what happens when you are right is that they take in 180 degrees of peripheral vision. So it's a frequency that is coming from their inner process, this inner vision frequency. And when you're dealing with six, this is more the tactile frequency, something that touches you so deeply physically. And then with the five, we're looking at auric frequencies. So you remember how we have one, two, three, four, five in line quality, five being the fullest differentiation 
of the hexagram structure and six is moving beyond. Everything about understanding right rave variables is that we have to understand the essence of how all of this works, which is auric. And in the case of a rave penta, trans auric. So the fifth tone is all about frequencies that we call auric, not physical, they're aura based. So frequencies, in other words, that are electromagnetic, any frequency that is picked up in the chemistry, temperature, pheromones in the air, um, things that are beyond our sensory capacity to even smell, taste, or look at. But at a deeper level, taking in, because right is receptive, taking in a huge Russ's incredible range of being able to receive. So all of this information that the rave is taking in, if we link what feeling is mentally um, to be translated into, it's about judgment. Okay, feeling cognition on the, on the body side, brain body system feeling, but on the mind side, we look at it, that fifth tone as judgment. So then the rave will be able to judge. And what it's doing then is for the judgment of the penta. Tonal cognition and frequency interpretation through absorption, through receptivity, will give the penta so much data, a vast array of information that it is going to process and work with. Remember, when they come together in penta, then strategic. The fifth tone is directly connected to magnetic fields and everything about penta is that these penta members, once they are in that penta grouping, create a vortex. It's a magnetic frequency field that pulls the auras of the participants in and the five is all about the aura and magnetism, frequencies, yeah, feeling and judgment. So to understand Penta, we have to comprehend to our best degree frequency fields being their reality. And so if we think about, Ra wants to remind us about the evolution of the solar plexus, what we call the emotional system, our solar plexus center. What does this power do relative to the solar plexus, the emotional intelligence function? Well, first, if you're open emotionally, you can take emotions in. The emotions that you take in is something that you can process. And if you're defined emotionally, then what you do energetically is you put emotions out, consistently put emotions out out when you're defined. So open takes in, breathing, in processing, but not consistently broadcasting. That's the job of the defined emotional intelligence, our solar plexus center. So then what happens uh, relative to the mutation, this is a great way of of seeing it, emotions being taken in or being put out. What Ross says about this is there's something so profoundly simple and so terribly powerful about that solar plexus because it can do both things. It can be deeply sensitive and at the same time, it can put out a wave of emotion. So this ability or capacity in the solar plexus is to put out waves of emotion. And according to Ra, the deepest aspects of the mutation that is taking place is its capacity to either take in or put out. So when we remember in our emotional intelligence, our solar plexus, that we have certain wave patterns, okay, the mutation that's happening, some of these traditional emotional areas that we usually consider long, slow build and crash, pulse, or ratchet, stable and stalls, we're going to lose, according to Ra, the 
emotional wave, those waves are actually being compressed. So there's no wave when we have a fully mutated rave. No wave. But it will still have the capacity to put a frequency out. It's no longer going to be that brute force emotional frequency that if you've ever seen it in action, you know the damage it can do physically. And it's no longer a frequency that by its own nature is going to go up and down. No more up and down because of the compression of the wave in the rave, but still capacity to put frequency out. So taking in and putting frequency out is the mutation of the solar plexus in the rave. Their auric, magnetic, and chemical frequencies that they are attuned to, that they are receptive to, that they can perceive and affect in their world around them because of their mutation. So then the five opens up the doorway for that penta, feeling cognition on the physical body side, judgment on the mind side. This allows this five tonal cognition and the truth of how all of the right facing variables work is that a penta can realize judgment because that is the basis for the nature of which it functions or how it functions according to what we know about frequencies and pentadynamics, thanks to Rave informing us about how it's going to work. And some of it, yes, may be speculation, but it's our best guesstimation because, you know, his mastery of the system and so forth. If we look at six, oh, did I skip one? Hang on, let me double check that I didn't skip meditation. Yes, I did. Okay, let's look at four first and then six. Four, inner vision, meditation on the consciousness side, a state of being. Four represents core information. And this core information, inner vision, body side, meditation, mind side, that will be used to the advantage of the penta in any judgment that it brings in its strategic movement. So this is to be used by the rave. Remember, rights are here to be used. Yeah, the using of the melding of the frequency together. Now, I've been very careful to differentiate between body and mind. But in the way that Ra taught this material, you could interchange these on either side in order to understand them. And he would commonly do so. But my teacher, Andrea Reiko Wolf, prefers that we keep them separate. I'm just doing so out of habit. Um, it's not something that Ra is actually speaking to at this time. So in your future work with Raves, using these two terms when you come across Tone 4, yeah, inner vision, meditation, Tone 5, feeling and judgment, and now Tone 6, touch and acceptance. So the six is always, think about one, two, three, four, five, six. Six is the evolutionary movement, okay? It's always going to be a transition to what's beyond. If we think about six in a rave at the tonal level, the quality of the six archetype, ar or not architecture, there we go, six tonal architecture. This is the most sensory and sophisticated of the sensory gifts of a rave. So the potential through our physical contact here with anything, whether it be animate or inanimate, our, I should say, there, because it's rave we're dealing with now, the ability to take in detailed information from physical contact is what six color or tone, tonal cognition is about. That means then for this being who is on that comes in on the right. That is their natural bond to what is the reality of what a penta can bring or will be. So each one of them, either being four, five, or six, tonal cognition. And then that transauric magnetic vortex that is created, the right variables are built for that, giving of oneself over to the group 
to be attuned to it. And in this sense, empower it, the penta, as an incredible resource. Remember, if we think back to what raves do, gather, absorb, you know, perfect, that process of just taking information in, collect those keynotes of their circuitry. So that is the resource that they give onto the penta, the it of the transauric entity. So when we're looking at how a penta operates, the most important thing to understand is there this, this area down here, what we would call sacral, and it's colored in red to remind us, but it's not actually a sacral anymore. This is the area that is the key to how a penta is going to operate. The penta has a key, and this is its key. Okay, 5, 14, 29, the key to how a penta operates. And he says that it's very important in order to understand how penta mechanics move. He wants us to remember that the 15th gate and the 46th gate are not connected to the G center area of the penta at all. Those of you who have studied me penta mechanics, you know this, but for anybody who has not yet, notice the gap. So in a penta, when there are three to five people, the energy moves as such. Okay? It begins here. Those are the magnetic frequency fields that get the penta energy started and melds the energies together or homogenizes everybody together. That's where the penta starts. It starts at 15 and then 46. It's a unidirectional energetic field, a creature where energy only moves in one direction. So if I was analyzing you plus me, we would have a back and forth energy movement because in an individual, energy moves back and forth. In a penta, it moves unidirectionally, and this is the movement. Okay, the movement through 15, then 5, over to 14, 46, then 29, over to 14. So if we turn this in this direction, according to Ra, you're looking even better at it because this is the movement of energy moving up. And now it looks like he's got little feet and legs, and here's the torso, head, and arms. That's what it looks like to me. Okay, so we have this energy flow that moves up from 15 and 46 to what is the area of sacral. And the energy is all concentrated that is building from these two areas into the 14. And that 14, the energy taken up from either side, 100% of the energy that is generated between that three to five person grouping in a penta all gets narrowed down to the two. It flows only upward from 14 to two. So just like if we were, um, let's say, building a bridge across the water and we had to bring these two uh, bridges over to the 14 in order that we can get it across the water and then it had to split off into three places. If there was a gap here. If we didn't have uh, component pieces, parts of that bridge, a car trying to drive over that bridge would fall into the water. That would be a dysfunctional bridge, right? So I'm using gap terminology, bridge, to help you get a feel for why it is so important to have each individual gate activation being a part of the component pieces of the rave penta because otherwise that car is going to sink and they will not swim if it's very much, very much that they don't have um, enough to keep this together as far as functional. A dysfunctional penta is not a penta that will survive very long. So the gray in the illustration is the original way that Ra was given in terms of the glyph of the penta, this right here, is how he was given the penta image, the creature of what it looks like, this penta. 
So this is what he was given. And this is what we have mapped on in order to show you the elements of that creature. These are power points that you're seeing here in this glyph or image. And these are things we have to be very clear about. So now we're going to dive into them. You can see one of them here, the alpha key. And this has to do with the relationship that an outsider would have to its relationship to a penta, the alpha key. Okay, the alpha key is right here. Alpha key. Those of you who have studied um, animal, you know, mammals, this is how I remember it. My little kitten, my girl kitty, she's got the one eight like me. In mammals, this is the alpha, the design of the alpha. So that's how I remember where the alpha key is, that eight right there. Okay, the alpha key has to do with the relationship of an outsider to its relationship to a penta. So the outsider's relationship to the penta, there's the alpha key. Okay, so contribution being a key, just to help us remember, where is the key? Contribution being a key. Now, if we look here at the bottom, the alpha lock is underneath, at the root of this penta vortex creature. This is the alpha lock. And the alpha lock is what we're very particularly interested in because this is what brings the relationship of the autive circuit into the penta. So the lock is something that is uniquely for raves. Human pentas are not conscious. We are not locked in. So we grow up in a penta, our family, and we're able to leave. We go in and out of work pentas, um, practice pentas, religious pentas, knitting pentas, whatever you want to call it, all our lives. So the way that Ra would describe human pentas was like a lava lamp that constantly morphs. Human pentas constantly morph because they don't have this alpha lock, but raves do. They have the alpha key and the alpha lock. So this is the thing that we want to see in order to get a sense for how these pentas, why these pentas, rave pentas, would be locked into each other. So we're looking at what's being taken in in a human being in terms of the penta being able to tap into these six channels that operate between the root or the root of the penta, the sacral, the identity, G, and the throat. So penta taps into, in a human, these channels. So you notice that in a penta, we're not tapping into the awareness centers. There's no mind in a penta, no survival, no emotional intelligence. In a human penta, it just bypasses them entirely and concentrates all of its focus, its energy generation and expression through this middle core of the power column from sacral to throat. But if we go into a penta as human, it's only going to take what is directly above with it. So in other words, this G area and throat, which is built into our penta construct, it's a human penta is only going to take in this area. It doesn't take in the awareness, mental, splenic. It doesn't take in something that makes it conscious. Penta is a generative, controlled mechanism of demonstration in human. But in rave, it's different. So remember, in a rave, they're getting locked in. They cannot morph. There's no lava lamps here. They're locked. Okay, so the penta being able to become conscious is because a rave penta has the mutation of the autive circuit that can come into through the alpha lock. So penta needs sacral energy. If you don't have sacral energy gates, there's no vortex happening. Sacral energy, if we would go back to what a rave is, 
sacral energy carries all the information from the autive process, the mutation that's coming. So in other words, there's this capacity of the autive circuit that we've already taken a look at. All of this is present in the enveloping aura of the sacral. And this is what's being taken in. Once an individual, a being, is in the penta, the penta themes are at work, but they're empowered by something that is, according to Ra, quote, very, very aware. The awareness is a transcendent, melded awareness because they are rave. They are not human like us beings. They are rave beings. So this autive key, literally with its out, Alpha lock, autive key, alpha lock is the way that all of this fits together, which is why when Katja puts the raves all around in a rave penta image, she keeps putting this as the imagery to remind us that that is the autive circuit that feeds into the penta. So this is why the penta can become conscious. That mutated sacral center locks in there and, quote, you can't get out, unquote. So taking in this information in a very different way, the autive circuit has a very special relationship to the heart center, what we call the heart center currently, or ego center, and the vortex of the penta. So the central magnetic field of the penta, the penta vortex, that is generated when three to five people come together. That ego has a special relationship with the penta vortex in a rave, that mutated ego. So here we can see it overlaid on top, just so we can see the um, mutative effect of what a penta vortex in a rave will look like compared to human, which doesn't have any of this stuff in it at all. So, this connection, ultimately, through the sacral, it's bringing the potential of a very special willpower, willpower energy brought to the penta through the alpha lock. So the penta itself is not simply going to operate as human pentas do, with a materialistic direction. In a rave, it's going to be endowed with will and the emotional awareness, intelligence, frequency field that will become an it conscious. Not the raves individually becoming conscious, but the penta it self becoming conscious. So the ought circuit with its keynote of meld, that autive key with its alpha lock is the way that how this all fits together. And so for us to grasp about the autive circuit, this is the thing, the instrument that makes a conscious penta possible. That's what this circuit is designed to do and what it does. This mutated solar plexus awareness is literally going to be able to be tapped in by the penta because it brings that conscious awareness field with its willful determination into the configuration of the penta vortex, the melding that happens. This is the melding of the consciousness that is taken in through the solar plexus in its awareness, how it's being melded together and operating within through the basic penta structure is going to be our study. If it is something that we can indeed have any access to or grasp of when it comes time for us to analyze Rafe Pentas. So the thing that's essential to understand about this autive circuit in a rave with its keynote of melding or meld, for the autive circuit to express itself, to be one with the penta, and for that penta to become conscious, all of this has to feed up through alpha lock into the penta vortex in order for it to de be demonstrative to other pentas, not to us. We may be able to see the effects of their control of frequency when they touch us. We shall see. So what you're getting into, in essence, is that there is 
power. Look at all the power motors coming up to feed into that penta vortex. That doesn't happen in a human. Not in a human penta. It's this merging or homogenizing of just the energies within the penta dynamic that is from sacral to throat through the G, nothing else. But in a rave, all of this, you're getting in essence, all of this power from the will through the adrenalized motor of the 60 and three and the awareness that goes with it all, that flattening of the wave, because remember, no motor wave pattern in the emotional intelligence field. They can affect by putting energy out because they have the ability to affect matter in their penta dynamic of three to five people. So the awareness and the energy, everything that gets brought into the sacral through the alpha lock gets locked into the penta. And that penta has all this information that is brought with it, which is not the case when you talk about human pentas. So then what we have is a rave penta becoming conscious. Rave pentas becoming conscious. It, not the beings within. He's very clear about that distinction. But it, because they give over themselves to it. So no gender to the it. Just awareness of a sort, depending on what the component parts are of that penta. And so that's one of the things that we're going to look at, the themes of the penta dynamics based upon the component parts that are put together. And we are going to attempt to give enough signposts so that at the point of you encountering these penta creatures, you will be able to attune to how to analyze just from the data, the birth data being brought together into their effective, present, available database that we have to look with, look at and work with. So the parts of the penta are these individuals, right? They are these creatures that are giving over to the creature. Ray's penta becoming conscious, not its parts, not the leg, not the trunk, only the it. So what we're looking at is the emergence of a brand new creature when it comes to a transauric entity that is conscious because we who are human do not have access to conscious pentas. There's no ability to, you could see it in retrospect. You can become aware. In my experience, um, I can remember being in different pentas, noticing the gaps, and then noticing the focus of what our group was always focusing on. But that's an experiential process after the fact. Oh, this is what we tended to talk about because that's where our gap is. What That's where the um, quote unquote missing piece is. So after the fact, you can see the control mechanism of that penta, whatever the component parts and pieces create. But in this thing, this is a new creature because it will be aware. Each component part, legs, one, two, three, four, and a trunk coming together for it, the consciousness, the head to truly come into form through that vortex. So this is the thing that our program is creating, where the program is going. The general direction of what Ra refers to loosely as a communal, though singular consciousness. So there's their communal, however, singular consciousness. Communal in the sense that it is derived from the many, three to five, but singular in that 
once it locks them in, it will be conscious. At the same time, the many are going to supplicate themselves or bow down, if you will, in selflessness, giving over of one's individuality to the group think, you could say, a new consciousness emerging out of us. This is the direction of the program. And this is the mystery of what it is to be human witnessing this evolution. A conscious transpersonal form is what is being created and that has its power in a sense beyond the sum of its parts. Just like when we go one gate plus one gate equals a full channel that is greater than one plus one equals two. It's a third thing. The same thing is happening when we combine. Now remember, no penta is created equal. It is going to be derived from the genetic imprint of each of these creatures that are being born to give over of themselves selflessly, choicelessly, because once they're in connection, locked in, locked in because of the alpha lock and becoming conscious as a transpersonal auric entity, trans auric and transpersonal. So beyond its parts. And that transpersonal form will make decisions. The whole that is greater than the sum of the parts to the point that the whole will make its decisions because the whole, the transpersonal conscious entity will decide what to use, how to use it, and where to go with it. It meaning their experience, their life, their dimensionality, their direction, their power, their pod, I call them a pentapod, their pod of their people. So again, to remember, we cannot call a human penta a conscious creature because the human penta is not conscious. It doesn't have that capability. We can look at in the past and recall or remember what it's like to be in this group versus this group. This family lacked material resources. This family or this friend pod lacked direction or vision. This family lacked any kind of, um, or book business, let's go to business, administration, you know, or planning because there was no leader there, no leader, alpha leader there. You know, we can look back and we can analyze or we can, because we know about human pentadynamics, we can look at it and make recommendations based on the composite pieces that are contributing to a work group or the ones that have been born into a familial group. But they are still not and never will be conscious because there is no capability of that. They are not rave and rave are not human. Here, participants are conscious in the contribution of human creatures giving over themselves to a singular goal. That's what a penta is. Okay, We stick together because we are the ones who are making the work and demonstrating the model happen in the world. So Penta, transauric entity, is an organizing medium. It's a material. Whenever you see Penta, think material. It's a material directing medium. It's either family material resources or business material resources, but the participants are not conscious. Individually, they are conscious. I'm sorry. The participants are conscious. Individually, they are conscious. But according to the transauric entity nature, it is not conscious. There we go. So we have the perfection of the strategic in human penta land. Humanity lives out the perfection of the strategic in its possibilities of what we've encountered and we're coming to the end of that era. So when we deal with a bioform, we cannot give up strategy because if we are not strategic, we die. 
we have to be strategic. We have to process. We have to think, how do I get the best, whatever the case may be, in order to gather more material, survive on the material plane. So if you don't have somebody that's strategic doing something for you, then what can happen is you die as a human. You know, so little tiny baby growing up, no strategy, no agenda, not knowing how to care for itself. You need a mother or a father to step in and take care of you in order for you to survive. So we who are human have a perfection of the strategic. And strategic in the process of what it is to be human is the most successful way for bioforms to survive. The potential of self-reflected, individuated consciousness is our birthright, individuated, self-reflected consciousness, individuated for the human, not rave. The last form that has a potential to individuate is us who are human. We consider to be humans. Human trans, uh, transoric entities coming together in a rave, not human. The rave penta, not human, according to what we consider to be human. So individual means nothing to a rave. There is no individuality. There's no unique differentiated potential. The only unique differentiated resources are there brought into the conscious penta. That's what the resources are there for. And what a conscious penta is, is once they come together, they're all non-strategic, remember quad right, when they come together, then they are the great strategic creature. That's what a conscious penta is. It will look after the survival of its parts consciously. It's going to be a smart conscious penta, according to Ra, in a way that is so different, we don't know exactly how to um, process consider its nature because we don't currently know how meldus, melded consciousness works in the way that they will be melded together or locked in together. So our transition into 2027 era and beyond, this is what we are moving towards as a species. That's what the program is bringing. It's not about the fact that it's bringing raves. It's the fact that it's bringing these conscious pentas that's where everything is going. We are all components, all parts and pieces, even all of us coming together in an unconscious penta for humans, coming together together in an it for raves. And that, one more piece actually. We have one more animation here. Thank you, Katja, for this beautiful spiral. We are all components in a vast life program, according to Ra. So evolutionary speaking, evolutionarily speaking, we are learning how to come together. Homogenization is a commonality and a oneness. Raves are the perfect ones that give up everything. No selfhood, no ego, no nothing. They give up their entirety to the conscious penta. And that's not us. So how important it is we understand this with this knowledge that we have, the only key that we are given at the end of this time, our time to fulfill the potential of our individuation or differentiation is here now, type, strategy, and authority, human design, experimenting. Never again will we have human as we know it. So we're about to leave behind what is this glorious power and process where each of us in our basic divinity, our basic purpose, has a way in which we can transcend all measurement. In our uniqueness, we can experience perfection for us. But that's the end. 2027, the end of selfishness, the so-called selfishness gene, because the paths are diverging. It's not bad, according to Ra. It isn't. It's what our form demands, this divergence into the melded consciousness of unity consciousness. A lot of people talk about that, yeah, but they really have no actual comprehension of what that can be like from the rave's perspective. 
because it's a different dimensionality.